This is Matthew Cratter from Trade University, and today I want to answer the question, will the UK freeze bank accounts? We're going to be talking about something very technical. It's called a bail-in, and many of you may not have heard about it, but this is definitely something that can happen in major economies and with major banking systems, as we're going to see. This could happen in the US. This could happen in the EU. I'm just using the UK as an example here because the UK has had this unbelievable volatility in the last few days that we've been talking about. The British bond market, as Jack Farley puts it in this tweet, the British bond market trading like a meme stock with the, the yields all over the place. We now know how bad the situation got on Wednesday. Pension funds in the UK would have collapsed if the Bank of England had not intervened and started buying government bonds. So they're now going to be buying $5 billion pounds worth of gilts or government UK government bonds for 13 days. This is really a switch from quantitative tightening back to quantitative easing and money printing. As I said, we now know how serious things got on Wednesday in the UK. There's a senior London-based banker who said at some point this morning, I was worried that this was the beginning of the end, adding that at one point on Wednesday morning, there were no buyers of long-dated UK gilts. In other words, there are no buyers of these government bonds. He says it was not quite a Lehman moment, referring to when Lehman Brothers blew up in the U.S. during the great financial crisis in 2008. He said it was not quite a Lehman moment, but it got close. If there was no intervention, if there had been no intervention yesterday by the Bank of England, gilt yields could have gone up to 7 to 8% from the 4 or 5% they were trading at. And in that situation, this is very important, around 90% of UK pension funds would have run out of collateral. They would have been effectively insolvent. So their, their, their liabilities would have been much greater than their assets. So what the Bank of England is doing is they're basically jumping out of the fire, out, they're jumping out of the saucepan and into the fire, as the saying is, and they're printing a lot of money using it to buy UK government bonds, which are called gilts. The problem is what happens when you print a lot of money to save your bond market? The answer is it eventually destroys the currency. The currency becomes the release valve. There's no free lunch in economics, as we're going to see in this video. If you're finding this video helpful so far, I just ask you to hit that like and subscribe button. So this is what's been happening to the pound. The pound's been getting pounded, so to speak. And even with uh, what happened yesterday, we're seeing more weakness in the pound. We're getting a little bit of a bounce here against the US dollar, but it's quite small because everyone knows that the Bank of England is printing money to buy these bonds. Could things get worse in the UK? Absolutely. But first we have to explore some terminology, the difference between a bailout and a bail-in. So a bailout is when a government or some other outside investor, like a Viper, like Warren Buffett, give the bank money to make up for a shortfall. This is what happened. We had the, the, the US bailouts after the great financial crisis of 2008 to 2009. Warren Buffett was one of these people who provided money to back Goldman Sachs, for example. So this is outside money coming in to, making up, to make up for a, a shortfall when a bank is essentially insolvent. A bail-in is even worse because the money is stolen directly from savings and checking accounts by the government, by the banking system, by the central bankers, and depositors are given in exchange for having their actual cash stolen. They're given crappy IOUs like stock in the failed bank. So the question then is, can something like this really happen? Well, it has happened already in Europe. It's happened in Cyprus and they had bailouts. They had a, sort of a combination of a bailout and a bail-in in 2013 where their banking system was insolvent. They were able to get relief from the ECB. But in return for this, in exchange for this, they had to haircut everyone's savings accounts. And so if we read what's inside this article, this is how it worked. People in Cyprus, this was 2013 Cyprus, people in Cyprus with less than 100,000 euros in their accounts had to pay a one-time tax of 6.75%. So they just took the money off the top before you could pull the money out. Those with greater sums will lose 9.9%. Depositors will be compensated with the equivalent amount in shares in their banks. So this is what happened if you had more money in the bank, you got even more penalized in total depositors in the bank, uh, especially in, in the largest bank, the Bank of Cyrus, lost 47.5% of their savings. And again, this was not invested in stocks or crypto or something. This was cash 
in the bank. So they stole depositors' money to help make the bank solvent. And this was in a major, very civilized country like Cyprus. So Cyprus had this bail-in in 2013, but you could argue, well, they were at the mercy of the EU. They were unable to print their own euros. The UK can at least print its own pounds. It is also, Cyprus is also a very small island. As we said, it's a small economy. So then the question is, would a major country like the UK actually perform bail-in for their banks if things got too bad? Or is this just some YouTuber's wild conspiracy theory? Well, I owe this video to Tour uh, Demister. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. He had a very good thread a day or so ago about, about bail-ins, and he has some amazing references in here, one of which I could not believe my eyes when I saw it. This is a publication from the Bank of England. You can go to the website. I'll stick it in the description notes below. Executing Bail in an Operational Guide from the Bank of England, published in July of 2021. So if you scroll down here, you can see uh, in this publication, it, the bankers write, today bail-in is a recognized part of the toolkit of stabilization powers available to the bank and other resolution authorities. Bail-in means we can be more confident that banks will be able to keep critical services operating through resolution and restructuring. So this is the central bankers telling you that stealing your money from the bank can and will be used if it's necessary. And again, this is not some banana republic, or maybe it is becoming a banana republic. This is the Bank of England. This is an actual publication by them. And so if bail-ins could never, ever, never, ever happen in the UK, then why has the Bank of England written a manual on how to do it? A very extensive manual. It's 45 pages, pretty, uh, pretty full of technical jargon. So I think we can conclude the Bank of England, if things get bad enough, stands ready to confiscate your savings if things get too bad. So here's the game. This is how it works, not just in the UK, but the US and everywhere else. While you guys are busy arguing passionately about labor versus conservatives or Democrats versus Republicans or the left versus the right, what you'll notice, is, and this is always the case, both parties are busy supporting the central bankers, supporting Wall Street, supporting investment bankers, and doing their will. That's who they really work for. They work for the central bankers. They do not work for the people in, in most cases. When was the last time, for example, that you heard a successful politician criticize central bankers? It's very, very rare. The biggest example I can think of would be Ron Paul, and that did not turn out great for his presidential run. So I think it's important to remember this, especially in crisis times. Your government hates you. Your government does not care about you. You are just a pawn on the board. Your central bankers view you as energy pods, like in the matrix, and they view your savings accounts as energy pods that can be drawn on and drained to whatever extent they need to to stabilize the bank. Now you'll often hear people say, oh, I'm never buying Bitcoin because it's not good for anything. I'm never buying Bitcoin because it's too expensive, blah, blah, blah. But this is like saying that you would never pay thousands of dollars or pounds for a drink of water in the desert. And if you really needed it, you were out in the middle of the Sahara, you would pay whatever amount of money you had for that water. The 2020s, as I've said many times on this channel, are the end game. This is the fourth turning. This is what we've been seeing since 2020. We've been seeing really crazy things and things keep getting crazier. The volatility, volatility to the upside and the volatility to the downside. What you are seeing when you're seeing the collapse of the pound, when you're seeing the collapse of the UK gilt market, when you're seeing the dollar blowing everything up around the world, this is your financial system being rebooted right in front of you. There are a lot of stresses to the system right now. And that's why I've been always saying on this channel, it might be a good idea to get at least a little bit of that Bitcoin stuff if you're able to in this context. And this might be like bringing water into the desert. You might be glad that you had a little Bitcoin. It looks like this is beginning to happen in Europe where and in, and in the uh, United Kingdom. Here's uh, some metrics showing investors selling euros and pounds for Bitcoin in record numbers in September. So this is what's happening. The money is not just moving into US dollars, it's using into permissionless, censorship resistant money that cannot be debased, which is what, what Bitcoin is. And these spikes are just unprecedented. These are the smart people. Well, the really smart people made this move before the crisis, uh, but this is, this is people exiting the fiat banking system and becoming their own bankers and storing their wealth in Bitcoin. I would say that even if you don't listen to me, you should listen to this guy. This is Harold Malmgren, who I like to quote on this channel. He had a tweet on September 26th. Think about it. Central bankers meet once a month in, in Basel, 
world economy in painful downturn, national governments frozen with indecision, might central bankers or central banks decide together to seize the reins, initiate central bank digital currencies, which we've talked about, CBDCs, realign debts and credit markets to restore global growth. Now, Harold Malmgren is not your run-of-the-mill conspiracy theorist. He's a scholar, ambassador, international negotiator, and he was a senior aide to President JFK, John F. Kennedy, Lyndon B. Johnson, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford. He worked for various senators. He is very, very connected in Washington, D.C. And when you see someone like this doing a tweet, this tells you that something may be about. I don't think governments can launch these CBDCs, especially the U.S. government and the ECB. They can't launch these things as quickly as Malmgren begins uh, thinks. But he might be right. He might be right that these are a lot closer than a lot of us think. And he seems to think something could happen on a monthly basis, that this could happen in, a, in September or October when the central bankers get together in Basel. I think this really is the end game for the 2020s. By the time this decade has run its course, there are only going to be two forms of money, and that's going to be CBDCs, which is just going to be fiat money. It's going to be spy coins where the government could really control your money, turn it on and off, and harvest it however they want for bail-ins or bailouts. And so you'll have CBDCs. And then the only alternative that I can see is Bitcoin. The problem with all the proof of stake coins, which now includes Ethereum, is they're very, very easy to capture and control because of their consensus mechanism. And if you want to learn more about that, I will link to this playlist where you can read all about or listen all about proof of stake and the problems with it, how easy it is for regulators and governments to capture it. So the real choice here, are you going to be in CBDCs or are you going to be in Bitcoin? I think this is the choice that every family and every individual is going to have to make before this decade is over. So it might make some sense to get some Bitcoin while it's still so easy to get it. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.